This next bit then is really to get some feedback on how uh, the team working went. And I'm delighted to say we've got a fabulous panel uh, here. We've got Lucinda Hensman from Coca-Cola, John Joseph from Burt's Chips, Violetta Stevens from Cafe Direct, and Matt Sexton from B&Q. So they were spread around amongst you. Um, and one by one, they're going to give us a bit of feedback on what the challenges were discussed on their table in, and in their working group, what came up. And at the end of each one, I want to open it back out to the floor because, of course, there's only one voice from that working group and only one voice from a table. So I really do want to hear from the rest of you if there were other things that were discussed that haven't been captured or if you feel a fact that, you know, they, they didn't represent your, your views and the views of the group you were uh, in. So, uh, Matt, do you want to give us your... Your take? Out of the holy trinity of waste, energy and water, I chose to sit in the water group. So my interest in that, uh, in the water group, was the fact that actually we find energy and waste as a business quite easy to deal with from a financial point of view. Uh, you know, we know that energy prices are going to go up, we know they're high and we know the paybacks are reasonably good and we know that waste disposal costs are going to go up and we know that waste is becoming more valuable in a resource-constrained age. So those two are, have not been difficult sales. What water we have struggled with, you know, it is a bit odd. You have this material which is in short supply and traditionally prices go up when you have that situation, but water doesn't seem to go up a great deal. So we debated what was the solution to this. We didn't necessarily want to see water prices rocketing skywards, but how do you introduce some sort of tension around water and how do you actually make people value it? Um, and one of the discussions that we started getting involved in was, you know, do you need some sort of capping scheme? Do you need some sort of trading scheme to actually give people a vested interest in valuing water and actually minimising its usage? Um, so that was the closest that we got to a, a solution on that. Um, I guess allied to that, uh, the next topic we discussed was measurement. You know, unlike carbon, there isn't really much of a standard measurement system for the environmental impact of water. Um, and, you know, should there therefore be some form of standardization which allows you to calculate its impact, that makes it easier to see it, to make it more visible. Um, and, you know, the question was, should actually, you know, government get behind that and instigate that in the way that perhaps it did with carbon um, a few years ago? The, the sort of third thing that came out, I think, really was around visibility. We had Stuart from Scottish Water who referred to, uh, to water as the invisible utility. Uh, you know, it's quite low profile. Because of its value, people don't take it, tend to take a lot of notice of it. Um, and so, you know, how do you, how do you bring about, how do you up the need to disclose how much water you use and what you're doing about it. Um, and that was something which we felt we should look at. Um, and I suppose allied to that, from a consumer perspective, how do we get consumers to actually create a degree of pressure around water and to understand it as an issue? Um, you know, it, it's quite a difficult issue to get your head around, you know, the concept of embodied water in a product up the supply chain. You know, these products are produced a long way away. But we've seen the way that fair trade took complex ethical issues and gave consumers direct sight of them. And at that point, consumers actually said, well, I, I do care about this and I'm going to exercise choice in terms of what I buy. So um, I think there's a, there's a job for, for us to do as brand owners around raising the profile of water um, in that respect. Um, and I suppose the, the, you know, the final theme that we touched on was the fact that water is sort of deemed to be immobile, you know, it's confined to geographical areas, but actually it isn't. Water moves around the world, you know, all, all over the place, you know, embedded in products, um, and yet actually precious little heed is paid to that. So um, I don't think we came up with anything sort of groundbreaking in terms of solutions, but there was, a, there was a lot of agreement uh, you know, around the central problems surrounding water and, um, you know, and, and that something must be done. Right, OK, so challenges around valuing it, mm -hmm. challenges around uh, measuring its impacts and the need for standards, uh, challenges around how we engage consumers and build a profile in particular, and then this notion of water that's moving globally with inside mm -hmm. products and surfaces and, and, and so forth. All right, was any, that was that side of the room, wasn't it? Is that right, Walter? Yep. Thank you. Rob Lawson from AMEC. Uh, another sort of tick on the uh, number of issues that you highlighted there, Matt, is that under the government's water white paper, there is the prospect of water trading on the horizon, uh, which could include some sort of cap and trade or similar kind of um, process for, for better value in water in terms of its environmental value as well as, as, well as its value to uh, consumers, business uh, and uh, industry. So. Uh, Fantastic. I'm feeling talks. better already. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. Excellent. And there's a gentleman there.
So it's going to be the third solution, aren't it? Uh, <laughs> just again for, for, for Mark, uh, on um, water footprinting uh, in last year's Natural Environment White Paper, government promised that they would publish water footprinting guidance to business by the end of this year. So maybe uh, talk to DEFRA about that. Um, and just say what the other gentleman said about water white paper. There is um, introducing a shadow price of water system called the abstraction incentive mechanism. Uh, it's going to be coming in as part of the draft water bill, hopefully. Great. Go All right. Fabulous. Well, we've got some, something to get our teeth into there by the sounds of it around water. OK, Lucinda. Yes, so I sat on the waste in the waste session. Recycling is a huge area for Coca-Cola Enterprises at the moment, and I guess it's an area where, in retrospect, we feel we need some innovation. So that's why I was there. And interestingly, when we went round the table, I did feel that even though we came from very different companies, and I was talking about the consumer end of it, and others were talking about what was happening within their company, um, there's a huge parallel. And ultimately, the reason we create waste is because either the process is wrong or the behaviours are wrong. So ultimately, we need to change both. And looking at our tablecloth, huge title, need disruptive change. And so I think that's probably the big message that came out of our table, certainly. And some ideas on disruptive change to stop generating waste. Um, I think we need new forums to generate the innovation we need to eliminate it. And that's for reflection on my side from here. Um, it's interesting to see the parallels, um, or rather the complete distinct change in dialogue when we have our supplier summit and we put people around the table and say, innovate, innovate. And they can't. They, they don't want people. We, we can't put our refrigeration suppliers together because ultimately, European competition law, people don't really share. So the big, the nice thing about this is, is that lots of people from different industries, different perspectives come together. And I feel it's a very creative forum. And I think more of these is prob are probably needed. Um, and new business models. We talked about this, the leasing business model, potentially a huge way to eliminate waste. Um, and thirdly, the changes in processes. I think a big message that came out of, from what I understand, uh, well, a big message that came out was really that a lot of waste is generated when the requirement, the customer requirements, are set in such a way that there is no other choice than to generate waste. So that's about going back to the drawing board and rethinking processes and finding new ways of doing it. And that brings me to the, the next point that was, I think, fantastically well made on our table, which was actually we need to look at who's at the table. Very often we find it's the you know the procurement guy and the 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 client, this, um, customer and supplier a and actually is it the CEO should it should it be the CEO should it be the CSR guy should it be should we need that range of perspectives to make sure everyone else is is being represented I think that that was an interesting one for me um, and and to think a bit about the incentives we're we're offering to our suppliers. Um, why should they remove waste from their supply chain if we're not helping them with the standards? But also, um, if once you get to a preferred supplier, how long do they remain the preferred supplier for? How else can other people get in and what do they need to do? So are we encouraging that, that excellence throughout the industry, not just within one supplier? Um, and the cost reduction focus in procurement doesn't necessarily allow for that change. So that was, that was another point. And then, I guess... A personal reflection again, probably less on waste and more generally, is that we've had a lot of focus on measurement today, of talking about how we measure things. And um, I think that coordination around how we measure these things is definitely coming out as a key theme for me. And um, I think the other thing I'd love to see is coordination of the coordinators. There's a lot of increasing numbers of coordinators, and I think one, one or however many, but I think that platforms is probably enough. And if we could get the coordinators to talk more to each other, I think this would be a whole load easier for, for us on the questionnaire side of things. So just a few thoughts from me. I like that. Coordination of the coordinators. Excellent. So I heard need for disruptive change. Um, I wrote down here, you cheeky of me. More two degrees forums to drive innovation. Yeah. Yes. Working with customers on, uh, or working with customer processes so that waste is not built in from the beginning by customer demands. Is that yeah. right? I should probably refer that to the table because unfortunately I have to step out for a few minutes. So okay, just... so is that the table? Did can, I reflect somebody, the discussion did, adequately? Is that fair? Go on. The gentleman, could, Emma, could you take a mic into the corner? That would be great. Hi. 
Yeah, it's, it's Simon King from Palat Sock. Um, I think we thought that uh, the entire um, system of the supply chain itself was, was fairly heavily fragmented and that the, uh, the stakeholders at each stage um, when were completely disparate and not necessarily communicating with each other when to drive new ideas you need a unified uh, body uh, to, to, to take it through an organisation which may involve um, the logistics supplier, the supplier themselves, the manufacturer of the goods, uh, all of whom perhaps have their own separate section and somehow we want to coordinate those together so that new innovation can be uh, introduced into the chain overall. Okay, so this touches on the question that uh, Lucinda mentioned about who is around the table. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, all right. Fabulous. Any other additions from the, the waste working groups? Anybody want to add anything? Anybody have a different perspectives? Whatever you say gets added into the program. So it's your chance to add in something you haven't. No? You're all you're happy with what's, what's been said as a summary? Okay, lovely. So, Violetta, last. Uh, what we, we produce is uh, coffee tea and, and uh, cocoa. Uh, and um, uh, we did an assessment of our carbon footprint uh, um, a few years ago and uh, we realized that 15% uh, of the overall carbon footprint comes from our packaging. So therefore in 2009 we set up a target for ourselves uh, to have 100% compostable or easily recyclable uh, packaging on all of our products. So the issue that I came here with uh, was uh, how do we make our packaging of the Rosten Ground coffee 100% uh, home compostable. So I was in the waste group as well. And uh, I must say that possibly I hijacked a little bit uh, with my issue, the conversation. Uh, but it was very interesting to, to hear um, that other companies also share, other businesses also share the, uh, similar, similar issues. Now, why for us that is an issue? First of all, because of the pure size of the business. We are a you know, small to medium enterprise. And uh, um, obviously, we are talking about cutting edge uh, technology in packaging, and we are not able to invest, our, uh, invest uh, uh, money to develop such a packaging. So um, the, other, the other issue we have is how do you keep up with the latest packaging technologies as well? Um, and we know that this is changing rapidly. It's like any technology every day, there's something new out in the market. So how do we keep ourselves informed what's available in Europe but also outside Europe? New Zealand is very big and the US as well. Uh, so the group uh, um, kind of came up with a couple of solutions and uh, one was again using the Two Degrees platform uh, as a platform where we could put a challenge and uh, hopefully uh, find other um, uh, companies, uh, businesses okay. interested to collaborate with us and um, um, also hopefully this will allow us to scale up the operation as well. We need to manage the cost as well of uh, new development so if we are able to scale up and join forces with a like-minded organization from a non-competitive um, uh, sector uh, then uh, um, that will be very beneficial for us. Um, we have also discussed um, that while um, whilst the retailer sits on top of the supply chain, um, are they solely responsible uh, to have uh, the conversations down the supply chain and uh, specifically are they responsible to have the conversations uh, directly with the consumers? And I think the third point, uh, we kind of discussed it was a broader point, was how do you broaden the conversations again on the broader value chain? So I heard a lot about how do you make our packaging 100% compostable? What are the challenges with keeping up with technology? What are the challenges around the cost of the technology? Um, whether we can actually run some sort of innovation challenge over the next three months as part of the program to help address some of your, your, your issues, which I'm sure we can do. Um, and then lastly, what was the role of the retailer in broking the conversations both to the consumer and creating the right sort of demand with the consumer, but also back down, up, upstream, upstream uh, with the supply side. Is that right? Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Does anybody want to add anything to the conversations as a, as a way of summary? Kind of last kind of quick moment. Anybody? No? All right. Well, please give the panel a, a round of applause. Thank you very much indeed.